lot of activities that are planned uh, for this day. And uh, appreciate, again, you being here on this Sunday. God has been good to us. We are a blessed people. Praise God. How many believe that you're blessed today? I do. I believe I am blessed. Praise God. And so I'm not going to read a traditional text this morning. What I want to ask us to do today is for us just to ask the Lord to speak to us in this house and to use this day to glorify Him. It's good to have, again, everybody with us today. Cheyenne, uh, it's so good to have you with us visiting with uh, Brother Danny today. And uh, I believe it's family, and uh, it's good to have you with us. And uh, also... Uh, something we're still working on the best way to get this information but we missed Prentice's birthday was last week on Friday it's this week on Friday so we missed it in the bulletin this week and so we're working on the best way to get that information as as folks new folks start coming we're uh, trying to update those records but every once in a while something slips through the cracks like that and so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that this morning let's ask the Lord to move in the next part of this service Lord Jesus I thank you for your presence I thank you Lord for folks that have come and gathered here at Harvest Church on this Sunday morning wanting to hear your voice and I believe Lord this worship team today has ushered us into an awareness that you are here we want to hear from you today use the word to speak into our lives challenge us change us with your presence I pray pray and we thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus name amen amen praise God you can be seated today thank you so much for your worship in the house of the Lord today today is the first Sunday of May it is the week before Mother's Day and yet if they'll go ahead and throw this picture up on the screen this man right here anybody know who this is it's kind of hard to recognize him in uh, the photo there, but even if it was a blowed up, clearer picture, I don't know that um, you would know him. Uh, Alan Schmidt, uh, he lives in White House Station, New Jersey. Today is probably a little more of a special day for him. Uh, this month, Alan realizes the fulfillment of a long-held dream, and it is a dream that has taken him to 50 states of this great union. Alan is a member of the Extra Milers. I don't know if you've ever heard of this club or not. This club has about 300 members, and each person shares a common goal. And that is to not only visit every state in the United States, but every county within each state as well. And so only about 14 members have reached this goal at this point. And these extra milers, they have a motto. The shortest distance between the two points is no fun. In other words, they like to travel. So in an article found in the USA Today, Craig Wilson details activities of this group. You can find it's an older article. Uh, some choose to engage in a certain sporting activity in every state, like golfing, scuba diving, or marathon running. Other members are seekers. They look for the nation's smallest post office, or they desire to visit every ballpark in the major leagues. Still others are collectors. They collect photos of highway signs that correspond to the state's entrance to the Union. For example, since Delaware was first, they looked for a highway or a route named, numbered number one in Delaware and so on. So, yet there are other members, like this man on the screen today, Alan Schmidt, who have specific culinary tastes. Um, one club member aspired to eat a Big Mac in every McDonald's in the United States. He's still got quite a ways to go, by the way, but he's, he's working on it. Alan had another goal. Um, this goal can be summed up in a single word, and Sister Ross, you're going to really like this word. Well, I remember traveling in quiz tournaments. His word is blizzards, and he is traveling in the United States going to Dairy Queens, and he wants to go to one Dairy Queen in every state and have one of those thick frozen concoctions mixed with various ingredients and served up in Dairy Queen. Now, Alan has a goal, and he wants to eat a Heath Bar Blizzard, not just any blizzard. I'm getting ready to get you hungry, but Heath Bar Blizzard, and he wants to purchase one in each state of the Union at Dairy Queen. Last month, Alan ate one of those frozen treats in Providence, Rhode Island. That was number 49. Now, before he dies, Alan had one more that he had to eat. And on May the 3rd, you guessed it, just this past Friday, Alan ate his last one all the way up in Alaska. That's why you're seeing even uh, snow on his boots there because apparently where he was, it's, it's not spring yet. You know, it's not feeling like it anyways. 
Alan Schmidt has eaten a Heath Bar Blizzard in each of the 50 states of the Union. Why? There's just this unexplainable longing within man. There is a hunger to satisfy. There is a thirst that we want to quench. There is an itch to scratch. There's a longing, a longing for something more. My text is a bit unorthodox this morning. I usually read from the King James. It may seem slightly unusual and even irreverent at this point. I apologize if it seems so. It just seems to say it a little better than those in the courts of King James at this one. The familiar sacred phrase, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is rendered the following in the Peterson's Message Bible, Psalm 23, 1. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. That's the way I feel today. But I ask you the question this morning, is God enough? Is He really enough in your life? Are you living as if God is enough? I'm going to preach to you this morning on that subject. Is God enough? I want to introduce you to one more man. I couldn't find his picture. I tried my best. It's America's first known billionaire. And uh, the pictures that I found were so fuzzy that you would not have been able to have uh, seen it, so I didn't want to waste your time trying to figure out who it was up there. The late Howard Hughes, born in Houston, Texas, early on, he announced his goals in life to be the world's greatest golfer, the world's best pilot, and the world's best movie producer. Yet, if his life was determined by whether he reached each of these three goals, then he died a failure. Hughes was a codeine addict in the later years of his life. His addiction in crazed uh, crazed state left dozens of needles broken off into his body. He was obsessed with Kleenex boxes, paranoid of germs. And when his health finally broke, a midnight jet was dispatched to the famed Texas Medical Center in his hometown of Houston. It didn't make it in time. And what greeted the funeral directors at Glenwood Cemetery were the remains of a frail, filthy man with a scraggly beard that hung to his waist. His hair reached the middle of his back. His fingernails were two inches long and his toenails resembled corkscrews. Golf courses were not enough. Power and fame weren't enough. Hollywood and all of its fashion was not enough for him. A billion dollars was not even enough for Mr. Hughes. Why? For none of these can ever take the place or fill the void that has been placed inside of us by the Almighty God. For it is only Jesus Christ that can satisfy your soul. I'm preaching to us here today, it's okay to go to college and get an education. But don't you ever forget, that's not going to satisfy you. It's okay to have a nice house and drive a good automobile. But that's not going to be what brings happiness and satisfaction into your life. But what is going to bring true joy is going to be the fact that you know that your name is in the book of life. And that I am saved. And that there's a mansion that is waiting for me in glory. I'm asking us today, is God enough? Because I look at my society today, even in the church world, and I'm finding where sometimes we live as if we question, is God enough? There is a longing within each and every one of us. God put it there. It was found in our parents, Adam and Eve. What took them to the forbidden tree to partake of its evil fruit? It was a desire, a longing. What caused Israel to turn from food of angels back to the melons and the leeks? and the onions and the garlics of Egypt it was a longing what was it that would cause David to cry out when he is surrounded by his enemy oh that I have water to drink from the well of my childhood it was a thirst within a thirst it was a thirst for a day gone by it was a longing and I'm here today preaching to somebody in this Sunday morning service that you come and you really know you're not happy you may put a smile on your face but you're not really happy deep down because there is a longing that says there is something more and I'm happy to tell you you have come to the right place that God says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness that he will fill you he will satisfy your soul it just seems that a man is born dissatisfied we reach we grasp we strive and we're never satisfied 
We come into this life clutching, accumulating, and gathering. None of us is a stranger to the empty, emptiness inside that shouts, I have not and i got to have it. A two-year-old, I've learned this with Matthew. <laughs> They're never satisfied with just one cookie. That's right. That's right. And one mouth, and they try to put it all in there at one time, you know. More. I want more. You can take that little kid and throw him in the air and catch him. So you're wore out. And what are they going to do? One more time, Dad. Or as Matthew will do, he'll jump up and down and say, Again, again, again. I'm like, no, no, we're not doing it again. More. Give me more. We laugh at these kids, but us as adults, we'll finish a project. We stop and look at it for a minute. And then we say, what else can I do? It's what society calls living large. It is the desire to be the most with the mostest. We want the finest homes, we want the finest automobiles, we want the finest clothes, we want the finest view. We hunger and we thirst for more and more, and yet we seem to enjoy the acquisition less and less. Have you ever found that once you got what more of what you wanted, you really didn't, think, you really didn't like it when you got it? And you thought, well, you know what, maybe if I get a little more of it, it'll help. You can call it the Esau syndrome. It's profane, which means unholy or worldly. It is profane to discard the priceless while reaching for the value. It is empty to cling to fool's gold while real gold is in our midst. It is vain for us, hear me today, to clutch to the temporal while ignoring the eternal. For the Bible says to set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth. Why? Because heaven and earth is going to pass away. But friend, the things spiritually that you receive from the Lord will go with you into eternity. Money will buy a bed, but it will not by sleep. Money will purchase books, but it will not give you brains. It can provide food, but it's not going to give you an appetite. Money can purchase a house, but it doesn't make it a home. It can bring medicine, but not real health. Money can supply amusement, but not true happiness. Money can even bring you religion, but not give you salvation. Money can get you a passport that'll get you everywhere except heaven for the only way that you can can make it to heaven is to obey the word of the Lord and to be born again. Come on, somebody. Too many people are trying to use natural things to fill a supernatural void. You don't need something. You need someone. For the psalmist said, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You quit looking for that something when you find the someone in your life. You don't need drugs. You need Jesus. You don't need a material substance. You need Jesus. You don't need that group of friends that you think you need. You need the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You need Jesus. He's a counselor in troubling times. He's a healer when we are sick. He is a deliverer when we are held captive. He is a savior for the lost. And when you find Jesus, you have found everything that you need. And if you believe that, would you put your hands together and thank the Lord that he is your provider. Hallelujah. God is the satisfier of your longing. Not things. God. Not possessions. God. And I'm not preaching against goals today, but even goals won't bring you the satisfaction Jesus can. Projects finished. Offices attained. It's not going to bring it. Only God can. Just God. Somebody say, only God. God. You have made our hearts for yourself, O Lord, said Augustine. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. God is sufficient. He's the one who is enough. If you look anywhere else and you will find there is nothing 
that will satisfy. It is in Ecclesiastes, King Solomon once told himself, let's go for it. Let's experiment with pleasure. Let's have a good time. We're going to party. And yet in his carnal pursuits, uh, he was in vain. He called it vanity, nothing but smoke. He tried the fun-filled life. It was nothing but insanity. He tried accomplishments, but it was nothing but insecurity. He tried possessions and found that it was nothing but inadequacy. Oh, you can say it, wise Solomon. There is nothing. Shout it, King Solomon. There is nothing. Proclaim. Claim it, preacher Solomon. There is nothing that is better than your God. For the man who has nothing but God has as much as as the man who had everything with God. For if you have God, you have everything. But if you don't have God, you have nothing. I rise to preach to you on this first Sunday of the month of May 2019 that God alone can fulfill your heart's desires. You need to turn to Jesus and he'll quench the thirsting of your soul. I I like the article I read some time back and the lady described the time that she lost her best friend. While she was moping around the house, the Lord spoke to her and asked, why won't you let me be your best friend? She purposed in her heart to make God her best friend. And the first lesson she learned was that her newfound friend would listen when no one else would. She found she couldn't wear him out. He never said, I'm too busy. He never told her in exhaustion, not again. You know, What a friend. The second lesson that she learned about her new best friend was that he knew her better than anybody else, and yet he still loved her. Oh, come on, face it. We're not always lovable. Ask your family. (laughs) We're not always lovable. We're human. (laughs) We may have just brought up conversation for the lunch table, huh? In fact, here's something, bust your bubble. A fact, you know what? Pastor can even get grouchy sometimes. Yeah. But you know what? Here's the deal. This lady in her article, she described one hot summer afternoon <coughs> when her children were playing. They were fussing and irritable. And there ain't nothing that'll upset a parent than have more fussy, irritable kids, you know. And they had cried, Mommy, Mommy, one too many times. It's funny. Pause right there. In our house, it's funny. You know, all day long, it's daddy, 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 daddy. I say it's funny. She probably don't think it's funny. But at night, we have this camera that has a microphone on it. And we can actually talk to them. They can talk to us. And it's real nice for when, Brother Heath, they're not supposed to be out of bed. And you see them and you're like, get back in bed. You know, okay. You know, they they run, get right back in bed. Matthew, at night when he wakes up, it's been daddy, daddy, daddy all day long. For some reason at night, daddy don't come out of his mouth. It's mom. Ma, Ma, I'll tell you, Brother Acey, there are some nights where my wife don't have to say anything to me. But I know he's cried mommy one too many times. And I know for the sake of the child, I better get up <laughs> and go in there and help. This is, this, is where, this is where this lady is. You've all been there. You know, all day long, the, t- the child's just irritable. Mama, 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 mama. And finally she said, Lord, I can't stand my children right now. And she said, is there anything wrong with that? And the Lord answered her saying, I know how you feel. Sometimes I get weary of you yelling as well. Yet I don't stop loving you even though you cry a lot. Imagine a friend like that. He's a friend that says, I've collected each of your tears and I've stored them in heaven. He's a friend that says, I've planned good things for you. Even though you've not made the best of decisions in your life, if you'll stay in my hand, he's a friend that even when you're undeserving, you can live in expectation of the favor of God, for he is a friend unlike any other friend that you could ever have. And so I ask you, is God enough? Of course he's enough. For when you don't deserve it, he blesses you. And when you... 
Come on, I've got everything that I need for in him I have found this life. Hallelujah. The third lesson. I love this article. I've, I've got it saved. I, I go back and I read it every once in a while. and finally getting ready to use it in a sermon. I've been wanting to use it. Third lesson she said she learned when God became her best friend was God acted so powerfully on her behalf. When she took her problems to him, he did what no other friend could ever do. We try our best to help our friends out, but we reach the end of our resources eventually. But God can work out the situation because he doesn't run out of resources. She remembered when her friend's husband died of leukemia. She remembered hearing her friend say, Sometimes I wonder if God is enough. My intellect is certain he's enough. But sometimes it doesn't feel as though he's coming through. See, that's the problem, folks. Our minds might be convinced that God's a healer, that he is a provider, that he is a sustainer in difficult times and a deliverer. Yet our hearts securely, secretly rather doubt that he's any one of those things because our feelings get all messed up. I posted it earlier that we sometimes have to hold the truth of God's word above where our feelings are at. The reason is because your feelings will change, but God's truth never changes. If he said he's a healer, he's still a healer. It doesn't matter how much pain's in my body. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. If he said he's my provider, then he's going to come through for me. Our minds... You know, you know, you've heard it. Our minds are kind of like concrete, permanently set and thoroughly mixed. You know, and 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 and, and the apostle Paul, he would even address the issue in his, his his last letter. He knew that the end was in sight. There was a sharpened sword. I don't know if he could hear him sharpening it outside, and that's why he was writing it or what. But there was a sharpened sword that was awaiting him at the period a uh, pyramid of Cestius. Soon he would lay down his life, and in the midst of the last instructions to Timothy, we find this powerful assurance. Timothy 2.13 If we believe not yet he abideth faithful he cannot deny himself God is faithful even when man is fickle we have nothing but God we arrive at life's unchangeable conclusion when we get to that point where we say I don't have anything but the Lord then we still have more than enough God is my shepherd I don't need a thing for in the lady's last bit of wisdom, she revealed something in this article that touched my heart tremendously in the conclusion. It dawned on her that God craved a closeness with her. A closeness that she had substituted with earthly friends. Not only is there a longing with man, but I want to bring it to your attention today that there is a longing with God. That God desires to draw close to every single one of us. God longs for a relationship with you. Oh, please don't think this is blasphemy today. As big and as strong as God is, there's a weakness. He has a place in which He's vulnerable. He has a strong and tender desire to be close with each one of us. And that desire brought the Creator into the realm of creation. It placed deity in harm's way, if you will. God longs for a relationship with you. I, I guess you could say that God has one weakness. He longs for a relationship with us. Man, too, has a weakness. It's different. Each one of us, the Bible says, are like sheep. It's easy, if we're not careful, to stray from God. It's easy for us to go where we don't belong. Hear God's first question. The first question that ever came out of God's mouth was not, is there going to be light? He said, let there be light. He gets all through creation, speaks powerful things. What's the first question God ever asked? Anybody remember? Adam, where are you at? I haven't moved. Where are you? Mankind has a weakness. And it's so easy for us to, like sheep, wander off. But God looks for you. He desires to find you. Sin had hid man or caused man to try to hide himself. It was not that God didn't know where he was. He wanted Adam to realize what was happening here. 
The gulf of sin grew wider until it was so distant that no man was able or worthy to cross that gulf. In the Victorian era of the British Empire, Princess Elise died very young. The story of her death is the stuff of legends. Her daughter had been diagnosed with diphtheria. And each day, Princess Elise watched her girl grow weaker and sicker. Doctors had warned this princess to be careful around her daughter since the disease could spread through the sick girl's touch and even her breath. It was that contagious. Yet as death grew closer for her daughter, the princess could not stay away. And once while the child struggled to breathe, Princess Elise forgot herself and took her daughter into her arms. Rasping and struggling for every breath, the girl cried, Mom, kiss me. And without a second thought, Princess Elise kissed her dying daughter. She too contracts diphtheria, and not long later, she dies as well. Why do I tell that story? Because real love forgets itself. Real love really knows no danger. Real love doesn't think as much about the cost as it does the commitment. What does the Bible say? God is love. If you want to see what powerful real love looks like, think about how God forgot himself. He ignored the danger and didn't really think as much about the cost as he did the cross. And their mercy and truth would kiss. And in Isaiah 53, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And we stop right there and we could preach and shout right there. But look at the next verse. It's not an accident. The very next verse says, And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. God, my shepherd, became God my lamb. God my provider became God my provision. And he didn't do it for his sake. But he did it for us. He stays the same. But not me. We change. There's fickleness in man. There's restlessness in man. I told you, I'm so schedule oriented, it's pitiful. But you know the reason for that? Is because I get sidetracked so easy. It's part of mankind. You can get sidetracked. <laughs> Last night, we put the kids to bed. And uh, I looked at Kelsey and I said, let's be a kid again. <laughs> and I pulled out. Brother Justin, I don't remember how many years ago it was. It was about maybe three years ago, something along there. He built this little game system for me out of Legos. Really neat. It's got the Cubs emblem on it. And uh, it was right about the time they won the championship, I believe. Yeah, so it was right about that time. And so... Uh, anyways, he builds this little game system out of Legos, and we decided last night we were going to just get it out after the kids went to bed and played. They had been playing on it. And so we started playing this game called Mario Kart. And we got to this one level, and the only thing they would do is try to distract you. It took us about four times to finally get beyond this level. But we were playing this little game together, and all of a sudden there would be this ghost that would pop up and just start flying along. You could drive right through it. It wouldn't hurt you. It didn't do anything to damage Mario Kart, nothing like that. It was just there to get you sidetracked. And he would always pop up when there was no guardrails. And you'd run right off into hot lava and have to start over, and it'd put you back in the last place and all this stuff. I said all that to say this. 
in life, there are things that won't hurt you, but they're sidetracking you. And in essence, it's making you make bad decisions in your life. And it's causing you to turn away when you don't even realize it. Have you ever noticed somebody that's driving and then they maybe are looking at something? What happens? Most of the time, you're going to start turning toward what you're looking at. We talk about that in, in holiness. Be careful what you're looking at. Because what you are looking at, even, even if the thing itself is not bad, where is it leading you? Where is it taking you? We've got to be careful that the things of this world don't become distractions to us. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It's not saying... He said, you're going, to be, you're going to be in the world, but you're not to be of the world. It's not saying that you don't live a life. He's saying what you've got to do is learn that God is my main focus, and he's enough. The one, the one, the shepherd became a lamb. Why did he become a lamb? Because he knows, I wonder. I can veer off the path so easily. So the shepherd says, I'm not just going to give you the, the symbol or the typology of me just as your shepherd. But I want you to realize I became one of you. I became the lamb for sinners slain. John 15, 13 says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But the next verse, John 15 and 14 says, you are my friends. We talk about no greater love. He laid his life down for his friends. And then he says, you are my friends. If you do what I've commanded you. No matter what you are in need of today on this Sunday, I ask you, do you still believe that God is enough? Paul would write in Ephesians chapter 3, and I close with this passage today. Would you stand with me? To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You ever went to eat a meal? You said, I just can't eat another bite. I'm so full. I'm going to play off that a little bit. He says, to know the love of Christ is to fill up on God. <laughs> and then he says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. Above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. What power, Pastor? The Holy Ghost. So that's where we got to start. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you need the Holy Ghost today. You repent of your sins, telling God you're not just sorry of your actions, but you're making an about face. You're turning from that life and going to live a different way. And then you go down in the waters of baptism in Jesus' name, and he activates a promise. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You, the evidence of speaking in tongues is all throughout the book of Acts as the initial sign of the Holy Ghost. So your number one need today is the Holy Ghost. Everybody say the Holy Ghost. Is God enough? Oh, yes. But can I stop and say he's not just enough? We just read the passage that says he's more than enough. I tell people all the time, don't feel this way. I have people all the time tell me, Pastor, I didn't want to bother you with this little thing. Usually when, when, when they tell me that, it's developed into something bigger. And then we got a major situation. I tell them all the time, don't worry about it. Call me. We'll pray together over the phone. You know, don't. Small things. But then when even big situations that we bring to God, don't you think in one moment that you're going to bankrupt heaven when he moves on your behalf? I've heard people say, Lord, don't bless me, bless my neighbor. I'm not going to pray that prayer because God can bless us both. God's not running short on resources. In the end times, he says he's going to pour out his spirit. I don't have to worry about him running out of Holy Ghost for people. He said it's for whosoever will. 
Let him come and take the waters of life freely. I'm talking to somebody today, whether you have a big or a small need in your eyes. It doesn't matter. You know what? Small needs in the eyes of somebody else is big in the eyes of the person that has the need. It doesn't matter the size of the need that you may be trying to categorize it today. Is God enough? And the answer is most definitely yes. Would you pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your spirit in this house today. And God, there are needs in this building today that I know you are not just enough, you are more than enough. You're able, Lord, to heal bodies. You're able to save souls. Whatever the need would be, if it's financial, if it's the need to be set free from an addiction, God, whatever it is, today we come into this place with an understanding from your word that we can partake of the waters of life freely. We can receive the Holy Ghost. We can receive the blessings of God because you're not just enough, you are more than enough. I pray for every hearer of this word today. Maybe today we don't have situations in our lives to point to, but God, let us never forget your word that when a trouble arises, God, that we trust you because you're able to bring us not only through it, but you're going to bring us to overcoming this situation. God, I believe you're going to work on our behalf today, and we thank you for what you're going to do. I want us to do something a little different in this house right now. I want us to thank God for what he's about to do even in this service. I know you've got needs but would you lift your hands with me right now and let's just take a moment of thanksgiving and thank the Lord for his blessing already in our lives what we have experienced if you rode in a vehicle today you're blessed if you came from a from a house today you're blessed would you take a moment and lift your voice I know I know sometimes it's hard to sit down and really count the blessings but you ought to think about it if you got peace in your mind today that's a blessing from heaven you may not be able to point to material things but you've got something to be thankful thankful for. Would you lift your voice in this house and let's thank God for his blessings. Lord, you're good to us. You've provided time and time again. You're worthy, Jesus. Oh, come on. It's happening in this building. Would you lift your praise to the Lord? I believe there's faith that is rising that as we thank God together and as we praise together, God's building faith inside of us. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And when you step into this altar, God's going to provide for you. They're getting ready to sing. Would you step out? If you have a need today, would you find yourself a place to pray and say, God, I'm stepping out in faith. I know not you're just not just enough but you're more than enough come on let's come today and let God provide would you let God touch you today if you need healing for your body he'll do it in the 